release of toxic constituents from improperly disposed hazardous wastes has threatened human health and the environment by contaminating our nation's groundwater and surface water resources. To prevent this from occurring in the future, EPA's Office of Solid Waste developed the toxicity characteristic to characterize wastes as hazardous from the standpoint of their potential to release toxic constituents to the environment when improperly disposed. In developing this characteristic, EPA used, as a reasonable worst-case scenario for these wastes, co-disposal with municipal solid waste in an unlined sanitary landfill. EPA developed a procedure, method 1311, known as the toxicity characteristic leaching procedure, to estimate waste constituent release under this mismanagement scenario. This video documents further development of that procedure to better estimate release for difficult to filter wastes. Method 1311 is a batch extraction procedure that was developed to estimate the potential for wastes to release toxic constituents if disposed in a sanitary landfill. In this context, release is defined as the passage of waste constituents through the layer of soil immediately underlying the landfill. Method 1311 models two release mechanisms that can occur when industrial wastes are co-disposed with municipal waste. Release in primary leachate occurs when the mobile liquid portion of a waste moves away from the waste and into the underlying soil. This primary leachate can consist of aqueous and non-aqueous phases depending on waste composition. Release in secondary leachate results when municipal waste leachate formed as water infiltrates the landfill and percolates through the sanitary refuse contacts a waste and dissolves toxic constituents. This aqueous secondary leachate then moves away from the waste and into the underlying soil. The potential for a waste to release toxic constituents in the combined primary and secondary waste leachates is defined as a waste's release potential. Method 1311 models these two release mechanisms to estimate a waste's release potential. To demonstrate, method 1311 is applied to a synthetic waste consisting of a solid phase and a liquid composed of both aqueous and non-aqueous phases. The initial filtration step of the method 1311 separates the solid and liquid portions of the waste. Here, the filter models the layer of soil immediately underlying the landfill. The initial filtrate may contain one or more liquid phases. In this example, the initial filtrate contains a yellow oil phase and a red water phase. Both liquid phases are retained for analysis as an analog of the primary waste leachate. The solids from the initial filtration step are placed in an extraction vessel and extracted with simulated municipal waste leachate to model the leaching process in a sanitary landfill. After an 18-hour extraction, the material is filtered. The filtered extract, in this case containing leachable, red, water-soluble constituents, is retained for analysis. The filtered solids, here colored green, are discarded as they represent the portion of the waste that would be immobile in a landfill environment. To recap, the method 1311 initial filtrate is intended as the laboratory equivalent of the primary leachate, while the filtered extract models the secondary leachate in the real world. Together, the initial filtrate and the filtered extract form the method 1311 final extract, which estimates the total release potential of a waste. Although EPA has demonstrated that method 1311 is adequate for a variety of wastes, some wastes, including many oily ones, have been reported to clog the glass fiber filter. This results in incomplete expression of waste liquids during initial filtration. In addition, filtration results from different laboratories were at times inconsistent for the same waste. The objective of this project is to evaluate changes to method 1311 which would overcome its limitations when it is applied to hard to filter wastes. Robert Truesdale, a hydrogeologist at the Research Triangle Institute and the principal member of the research team, describes the approach taken to measure the movement of waste into soil. The objective of this research is to develop a method that can 
predict the leachability of oily wastes when they are improperly disposed. Our first step in conducting this research was to determine how oily wastes actually move in the real world when they're improperly disposed. We felt it was not practical to conduct in-ground full-scale experiments because of cost and time that's associated with such work. Uh, we went to the next best thing, which is soil column experiments, to simulate the release of constituents from a waste into a soil. These experiments were designed to provide data on how waste constituents are released from a landfill in the primary and secondary waste leachates. These data may then be used to evaluate the accuracy of method 1311 in predicting the potential release of difficult to filter wastes from a sanitary landfill. One of our first tasks was to select and procure waste for testing. We wanted to select a group of waste that represented as broad a range of waste properties as possible. Creosote sludge was selected and procured from a wood treatment plant. This waste has a heavy, very viscous oil water solid emulsion that has a consistency very similar to mayonnaise. Two commonly generated refinery waste, API separator sludge and slop oil emulsion also were obtained. These wastes, although they are oil water solid emulsions, have a much less viscous, more watery consistency than creosote. The final oily waste selected and procured was waste motor oil. As anybody who has ever changed the oil in their car knows, this is a very liquid, easily pourable oil that has a single phase. It's also perhaps the most ubiquitous and widely generated waste of those that we tested in this project. In addition to the oily waste, we selected uh, latex paint sludge, which is a polymeric waste that has been shown to cause problems in other extraction methods that were designed to test a waste leachability. Civil engineer Dr. Jeffrey Pierce of Duke University oversaw the design, construction, testing, and operation of the columns. We very quickly went to the use of, of three materials, either, either Teflon, pure Teflon, or glass material, or stainless steel. So we have a system that, 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 that's in use that, that combines a glass cylinder with a tef Teflon top plate and bottom plate with a series of, of stainless steel valves fitted with Teflon Viton O-rings connected with Teflon tubing. So we're, we're chemically inert, as chemically inert as we can possibly be. We selected four soils for our experiments. These soils bracketed a range of permeabilities from 10 to the minus 2 centimeters per second to 10 to the minus 6 centimeters per second. Uh, they are representative of anything from a coarse, freely draining permeable soil to a more clay, uh, less permeable soil. The materials we selected for these soils included coarse, very clean quartz sand for the higher permeability soils and fine ground quartz for the low permeability soils. Although soils often contain constituents such as clays and organic material which can sorb contaminants as they pass through the soils. These sorption processes largely affect just the movement of the constituents through the soils rather than the release or the passage of the constituents into the soils. Because we were modeling release with these column experiments, we decided that the cleaner sands and ground quartz would be better to minimize adsorption. This had the added advantage of making it easier to extract oily waste constituents from the soils prior to analysis of the samples. We went through literally months of preparation and, and pre-testing to determine how we could guarantee two things. We wanted to make sure that the soil column was reproducible. One column reproduces 